Hey, good morning, friends. Welcome to The Bright Side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for being here. 844-236-6010 is our number, as always, on The Bright Side. If you have questions, comments, success stories you'd like to share, if you just want to contribute to the conversation, if you have a health challenge you or a loved one needs help with, we're here for you, and we love hearing from you. 844-236-6010 is our number on The Bright Side. We'll get your calls in our second segment, we're going to talk to Paul Preston, the founder and president of the new movement, the movement for a new California state, the movement for a new California state. Paul's the host of Red Talk Radio, Red State Talk Radio's Agenda 21 Radio, and uh, he's got an interesting take on starting a new state in California based on what he calls COVID tyranny and the tyranny of uh, the tyranny of government. That's kind of what we're, we've been talking about, health tyranny on this program. I thought it'd be interesting to talk to Paul about political tyranny, concerned about the creep of socialism and communism in the state of California over the past 30 years. Paul has been searching for a way to stop the ultimate totalitarian takeover of the state of California, and his idea is to start a new state, the new California state movement. We'll talk to Paul Preston at the bottom of the hour, and we'll get your calls in our next segment, 844-236-6010. If you want to purchase Longevity products, go to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. There's a whole bunch of new Longevity products out, including the Digestive Daily, which I've been taking, for the last uh, six weeks or so, it comes in uh, digestive enzymes and various digestive supplements that come in individual daily packs. You'll find that at criticalhealthnews.com, brightsideben.com, and uh, pharmacistben.com, along with all the other longevity products. And join the team link that you can click on if you want to sign up to join the Brightside Ben team. You can also call 866-735-2470, 866-735-2470 for more information. Our number today, 844-236-6010, and uh, we've got Paul Preston coming up at the bottom of the hour. We'll get your calls in our next segment. So we've been talking about the long-term effects of vaccines. We've been talking about vaccines in general, vaccine vaccinations and testing and RNA vaccines, and really, that's really not the point. The point is, is how are we going to take care of our bodies? How are we going to take care of our health? How are we going to take care of our health business? We all want to have magic. The implication of vaccinations is magic. The implication of medicalization is magic. We all want magic. This idea that there's a medical solution for everything that can go wrong in the body. Wayne Dyer wrote a book uh, called There's a Spiritual Solution for Every Problem, which is really kind of a cool idea. And I, I, I agree there's a spiritual solution for every problem. In our world today, we believe there's a medical solution for every problem. There's a medical solution for everything that go wrong in the body, whether this medical solution is vaccination or pharmacalization with drugs or surgeries to correct structural degeneration. It's all, all this has an implication of cure. And magic. There's a reason why you can't say the word cure. Medicine owns cures. Anybody else, if they say cure, they they'll go to jail or they'll get fined. Cures and magics, cures and magical solutions. These are the realm of medicine. Medicalization is the idea that the medical model can be applied to all of life's challenges. And I I don't doubt that there's a role for medicine. I'm trained in medicine. I believe that there's times when you need medicine when it comes to emergencies and heroic intervention. In the case of dealing with infections, or perhaps uh, sometimes even in preventing infections, this idea that we can be better off, however, by mass interaction with drugs is not only a fallacy, but in terms of our health, it's actually counterproductive. In the case of vaccines, for example, mass vaccination without regard to the health or the situation, the environment of the patient is potentially dangerous, and it's silly. It's so, it's so silly, this idea of, of mass vaccination without regard to the how, how healthy or not healthy the body is. It's so foolish and so potentially dangerous that you have to ask if there's maybe other forces at play, perhaps control, or maybe financial reward, or maybe experimentation. Maybe there's other things that are at play here that are more important than the health of the people. There's a reason why some people get sick and some people don't get sick when they get, after they get vaccined, vaccin- vaccinated. There's a reason why some people react badly to vaccination. That's because the environment of their body is not conducive to being inoculated. To just mass vaccinate people doesn't make sense. To, uh, to mass vaccinate people is not scientific. It's not good medicine. It's not good science. And make no mistake about it. If the state decides they want to compel everybody to be vaccinated, they can do it. There was a, a U.S. Supreme Court case in, back at, uh, in 1905 
Jacobson versus Mass, uh, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, where the Supreme Court of the United States says said that states have absolute authority under the Tenth Amendment to uh, police power, police authority to enforce compulsory vaccination. I and mean, hasn't gotten to that point yet, but they could. It could. How did Bill and Melinda Gates become healthcare gurus and advocates for the wellness of the people? How come alternative ideas are being censored? Why is the mainstream media in complete lockstep about a pandemic, so-called, and uh, the conventional ways of dealing with, dealing with it that coincidentally control everybody that they're supposed to protect? Why are the most medicated? Why are we the most medicated culture in the history of the world? And at the same time, we're the most chronically ill. Health is not the same thing as medicine. Clearly, obviously, health is not the same, the same thing as medicine. We have lots of medicine, and we're, we're not healthy. Being medicalized is not the route to good health. Nonetheless, and this is really important here, because we can, you can go off on this uh, kind of deep dive of misery and of, um, of self-pity. As bad as our health situation is, and as bad as the medical situation is, it's nothing that a dose of critical thinking cannot help. We can and we should be masters of our own health destiny because the human biological system is a healing and regenerating system designed divinely to heal itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. From a metabolic standpoint, the body can heal itself. We can turn, the body can turn on a dime, but we got we to gotta do our business. We got to change the way we're living. It's not hard. It starts with food. Move to the digestive system, reduce your stress and toxicity, tap into the power of your mind and the heart, and recognize and honor spirituality, love our connection to divinity, whatever that means for you. It's not that hard. So we talked a lot about vaccinations in the last couple of days and our short-sighted perspective on how we take care of our bodies. Another classic example of the short-sighted way we take care of our health and our bodies is our use, our overuse, our misuse of anti Biotics. Antibiotic resistance is a serious, serious problem, and it comes from not understanding or misusing how we use medicine, how we use antibiotics. And we've known about it. We've known it was on the horizon since the 1980s, at, at least since the 1980s. That's when I first heard about it in pharmacy school. They, they told us that it's on the way. And today it's here. 40 years after the first antibiotics were released in the 1980s, we saw it coming, and it's here. Antibiotic resistance is when bacteria do not respond to the poisonous effects of antibiotics. We'll talk about that when we come back from our break. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll be back after this. On the bright side, I'm Pharmacist Ben. Got lines open, 844-236-6010. Paul Preston will be with us in our next segment. Paul's the founder and president of the Movement for a New California State. He's also the host of Red State Talk Radio's Agenda 21 Radio. We're going to talk about COVID tyranny and uh, the Movement for a New California State with Paul Preston in our next segment. And get your calls this segment if we have them, 844-236-6010. So... Antibiotic resistance is a real serious deal. Can you imagine if you get sick and you have an infection and your antibiotics don't work? What are they going to do? Now, there are now stronger antibiotics that we can use, but pretty soon nothing's going to work. Then what? Good old Dr. Hammerness told us about this in pharmacy school back in the early 1980s. He said, he said somewhere around the year 2000, we're going to be confronting a situation, and he was dead spot on right. Today in 2021... We have MRSA, 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 the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, among other forms of bacteria that don't respond as they did at one time to the sidle, the murderous, the killing effects of antibiotics. The cause of MRSA is resistance, overuse of antibiotics. One of the most fundamental concepts in antibiotic therapy is you don't stay on a course of antibiotic therapy for more than a week or two or maybe, maybe four weeks max. Yet for decades, patients were put on antibiotics indefinitely 
For months and months, sometimes for years, it was not unusual for teenagers to be put on a course of tetracycline for their entire for the entire span of their te- of their teenage years for six or seven years. It was not unusual for somebody to be put on tetracycline or erythromycin for six straight years. <laughs> this is absurdity. As pharmacy 101, you don't do this. But, but there were medical professionals that were prescribing antibiotics just to get the patients out the door. Just because the pa- I remember I asked a doctor friend of mine why she put patients on amoxicillin for viral infections. And she told me her patients didn't think that they were going to get their money's worth if she didn't prescribe something. And antibiotics were the safest thing that she could give them. So she was doing it just uh, to give their patients their money's worth. She was a physician. I, remember, I was blown away. I remember her telling me this. And then on top of that, we've got antibiotics that are given to livestock. In fact, there's a lot more antibiotics that go through veterinary channels than are sold to, than are sold to people. In 2019, over 13 million pounds of antibiotics were sold to farmers. And that means given to livestock. And that means not just in the livestock. Not just, there, it's also, that also means it's in the water supply. It also means it's in the soil. Usage in humans has been declining over the past few years as as physicians and and prescribers started to understand this whole idea of overuse of antibiotics. But in in terms of agricultural antibiotics, it's actually on the rise. One of the reasons that the agricultural industry, and it is an industry, we think of agriculture, a lot of times we think of the family farm, but it's much more of an industry than it is family farms. And one of the reasons that they're required to use medication is because of what is called factory farming, which unfortunately is the fate of 99% of the animals that we consume for food. Factory farming is hideous. Just go, if you want to be freaked out, I don't recommend anybody does it, but if you really want to be freaked out, just YouTube factory farming of chickens. Oh my God, it's awful. Factory farming is the practice of cramming as many animals into a tiny little area typically a wired cage so they can sell more meat or make more make more profit the close quarters creates this filthy unsanitary condition which inevitably results in infections and disease even worse as it turns out antibiotics make animals grow faster so antibiotics are given to chickens and livestock even if the animal isn't sick just to make them grow faster. The most egregious offenders of this antibiotic abuse of animals is the poultry industry. Chickens are notoriously filthy birds. Anyway, I, I was actually, when I was growing up, I grew up on a farm, and it's pretty amazing how filthy chickens can be. And by packing them by the thousands into cramped spaces, it only makes the, the filth even worse and increases the likelihood of infections making antibiotic use inevitable. They ought to use antibiotics. On top of all that, many of the animals are are genetically modified to be extra large, which increases, uh, the fact that they're they're so big, increases their their antibiotic requiring diseases. According to PETA, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, some genetic modification makes animals so large that their legs can't support their bodies and they suffer from starvation or dehydration because they can't get to the food. They can't walk to get to the food or the water. All of this means that meat eating and chicken eating is less than healthy, even though it's true that there are valuable nutrients in flesh foods. That is true. That goes without saying. And there's a lot of nutrients in flesh foods that you can't get in plants. And that's without, without a doubt. But overall, eating meat and eating poultry, because of the way we, we process them and, and grow them, is not healthy, and I don't care what people say about the carnivore diet. They're not taking into account that the food we eat, the meat we eat, is not the same meat that we ate in our Paleolithic days. The human digestive system is clearly designed to eat meat. That goes without saying. We're omnivores. We're designed to eat everything. But the meat we eat today is not the same kind of meat we evolved to ingest and digest. And that is the problem. In my opinion, that's the problem with the carnivore diet pro- promoted by Dr. Sean Baker in his book, The Carnivore Diet. I'm trying to get Dr. Baker on the bright side. If you, anybody out there knows how to get a hold of him, send me an email, ben at ksco.com. According to Dr. Baker, an all-meat diet is much closer to how human beings ate from an evolutionary perspective and 
Nobody doubts that. That is true. From an evolutionary perspective, we ate a lot of meat. We were hunters. But what Dr. Baker does not take into account in his theory is how modern meat is produced. Our hunter-gatherer societies hunted their meat. And their meat, the, the meat that they hunted was grass-fed. Nobody's hunting their Big Mac or their sausage or their steak fajita from Taco Bell or even their filet mignon. And uh, the meat, the, the cows are not eating grass for the most part. They're eating GMO corn or soy that has all kinds of stuff sprayed on it. Pesticides and fertilized, grown in fertilizer, fertilizer soil. And uh, our Paleolithic ancestors who were eating meat, they didn't have to contend with antibiotics. And they didn't have to contend with hormones. And they didn't have to contend with uh, GMO grains and their antelope or their woolly mammoth that they were hunting. So, so much for Dr. Sean Baker and his carnivore diet because that's the way we, we used to eat. It doesn't make any sense. The most frequently used antibiotics in livestock are the tetracyclines. And anybody who's been on a course of tetracycline knows that they tell you not to take your tetracycline with minerals. Why? Because tetracyclines chelate minerals. They attach themselves to minerals. That means that in addition to having to deal with antibiotics, now you've got to deal with, uh, with uh, meat that has less minerals in it. Or if you're taking tetracycline, now you have to deal with, uh, with mineral deficiencies. You can see all the problems associated with this idea of anti antibiotic antibioticing, that's a word, our meat and our people. And it's just a classic example of how we medicalize ourselves, how we pharmacalize ourselves without thinking about the implications. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We've got Paul Preston coming up in our next segment. We're going to talk a little politics, the movement for a new California state with Paul Preston in, uh, in our next segment on The Bright Side. Okay, we are back on The Bright Side. I'm Farmer Spent. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific and 10 to 11 Central Time. And 24-7 on the archive pages at brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. Thank you to Peter in the UK. Appreciate that. And thank you to Kevin, by the way, in, uh, in Russia for setting up our YouTube page. We've got all our, all our Brightside episodes up on YouTube. We also have a Facebook page, The Brightside with Pharmacist Ben. And uh, we also have blog posts and news stories and the longevity products at criticalhealthnews.com, pharmacistben.com. And brightsideben.com, and you can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team off the websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com. And don't forget to take a look at our truth, skin health products, never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifiers, water, silicon, vegetable oil, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want, all formulated by moi, by myself, in my compounding pharmacy for healing wounds. Healing wounds equals beauty and that's why we have 1,400 to 1,500 four- and five-star reviews up at truthreviewed.com, truthreviewed.com. All right. I am looking forward to speaking to our guest today. Paul Preston is a uh, radio host as well as the uh, founder, I suppose you'd say, of the New California State Movement. NewCaliforniaState.com is his website. Please welcome to the bright side, Paul Preston. Hey, Paul. Hey, how are you? Good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for coming on the bright side. So I've been I've been doing a deep dive into your work. You are one passionate guy, Paul, and I can see why. Ca California is turning into be this tyrann tyrannical state, and I I you know I always thought I wanted to move to California at one time, but but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. What what uh, inspired you to to take this really pretty pretty dramatic step of wanting to start a new state, and, and then what does it entail to start a new state? Well, um, what what started me down the road of starting a new state was I spent all my life here in California, and have really seen it, you know, change and evolve. And I got into public education. I was a public educator for forty one years, so I really was able to sense and see the pulse and find out the pulse of California from an educational standpoint. As I watched generation after generation of kids go through the programs and. Uh, watched the educational system start to decline precipitously in the late, well, probably the early 90s, really, for the most part, and then finally to what we have right now, which is the common core curriculum, which is a totalitarian um, curriculum uh, that's nationwide and worldwide. Um, 
so we saw the complete decline of education, massive dropouts that have, of course, a lot of those kids have found their ways into the prison, prison systems. And um, so I said to myself, there's got to be some better way to do this. And I was very, very much an activist administrator, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my superintendents and board. Um, and some of my board members were really not happy about it. But I, you know, I still always had to tell the truth. So I started uh, getting out into the media. I, I started a radio show in 1999 called the Inside Education Show in, out of Sacramento, California. And, and um, just started, you know, getting the word out about the high dropout rate and then all the problems that we were having. And I realized that um, this is such a huge systemic problem that businesses were fleeing. The Chinese were coming in and dominating our university systems. Um, you know, it's an open pass to get a foreign student into California because they paid much more in out-of-state tuition, tuition. But there was a real strong bias in, in, uh, for Chinese students to uh, occupy all the university seats. And, of course, that was a big deal for me because I'm trying to place kids. You know, high school graduates, kids that graduated from our schools into the UC system, and it was just open, blatant discrimination um, against the kids. And it was kind of interesting the way it started out. It started out in the early 90s against all white kids, white boys in particular, were being discriminated against. You know, you had these kids um, that had just these outstanding credentials, 4.5 GPA, all this other stuff. And, you know, traditionally in the 80s, kids that had those qualifiers would get in. It wouldn't be an issue. Didn't matter really what the color was. We, were, you know, it was uh, open society that way. There was not a lot. Of, there was not a lot of discrimination uh, at the university systems in the '80s. It started really the, the, the setting up that way in the '90s, and then uh, we noticed that um, it, it, a couple of years or two into it, it, it started to be the girls, the white girls, and they started to be discriminated against. And then we started to see uh, the Hispanic young men. You think this is kind of crazy? The Hispanic young men being discriminated against, mm -hmm. and you know, great record, you know. But we just noticed it; just seemed like it was all of our Hispanics that were not getting in, and then went the girls, you know. And then finally, it went to blacks, and then it went to Asians, and finally, by 1999, um, my I had a big count, um, counseling meeting, and we were wondering why are these kids, you know, not getting in. And one of my counselors, who was a black lady, a wonderful lady, she just looked at me and said, Paul, it doesn't matter what skin color, what ethnic group, they're all American citizens, and they're being mm -hmm. denied access into the universities. And most of the people, of course, that were coming in were Chinese. So that, that was a big tell right there that there was something going on. And um, this, they, in fact, there was uh, Ward Conley, heard of him, he actually put out a a proposition in the 90s to stop what I just described. And uh, he, they passed it, but the UC system just kept on breaking it. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. So what's, but, uh, what's, what's the end game? Well, the end game is uh, obviously to change our educational system into uh, a communist type of system, which is what we got. Uh, and that's really what we have here. Only the elite select few that are selected, and usually those are uh, individuals uh, with a lot of wealth and usually if it, uh, usually Chinese that get into the UC system. And uh, I know they, they would somewhat uh, want to attack me on that, but that's the truth. <laughs> it's hard so to hide from the truth. How does the new Cal how does a new California state, which by the way, I understand that you've actually declared independence from the state of California. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. That's so, part of the process to form a new state is to declare ourselves independent. So how does yeah, a new so California, how, how will the new California state address these issues? Well, it's um, uh, basically as we looked at it, we started to realize that the party the elections, the party system, the politics of California had degenerated, so it was a monoparty system. So you had the Democrats were constantly in office. There were never, you know, any shakeups that were going on in the legislature. It was always a, a monoparty system. Republicans were being marginalized and pushed out. And of course, your executive branches. The last time we had a Republican quote was Arnold Schwarzenegger. He came in on a recall for Gray Davis, but as it turned out, he turned out to be worse than Gray Davis. Um, but the, the the system had completely changed dramatically to where it was a, a huge bureaucracy with an incre incredible overreach into just about every business, just about all parts of everyone's culture and life. And uh, that was all. We looked at it and said, why does this exist this way? And we started looking at the Constitution of California and some of the flaws, and we realized that 
there was no way that we could possibly change the system by using the system itself because it had been so corrupted and so marginalized since 1870. Paul, uh, Paul, we're, lo- we're losing you, Paul. Can, can you hear me now? How about yeah. that? Uh, yeah, that's a better. I'm in, I'm in the right spot. I think I think I'm in the sweet spot where the signal's the yeah, best. But yeah, just stay right there because we, we lost you there for a second. We, we're okay. gonna have to we're gonna have to move on to a break. But but when we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about how uh, how COVID how, how you see this whole COVID thing because California seems like a a poster child for tyranny for COVID tyranny right. in terms of lockdowns right. and and I want to talk about that when we come back from our break. Okay, Paul Preston is with us. His uh, website is New California State. State.com and his radio program is Agenda 21 Radio. More with Paul Preston on the bright side right after this. Okay, we're back on the bright side. We're talking to Paul Preston, founder and president of the Movement for a New California State and also the host of Red Talk. Red State Talk Radio's Agenda 21 Radio. So, uh, Paul, it seems like, Cal- you know, this stuff's happened all over the country, obviously, even all over the world. But it seems like California is almost a poster child for government overreach with schools, ordering schools and retailers being to be closed. And churches, I understand you can't sing in the church anymore and everybody's wearing masks and there's uh, lockdowns and curfews. What, how does the new California state, how does that fit into this? How can the new California state address, first of all, what's your take on the government overreach and and how can the new California state address this? Well, New California state addresses it because we have a, a different constitution. The, the problem in California is its constitution has been changed over 600 times since 1879. It's, not, it's a worthless piece of paper, and mm. anybody who wants to get a, a proposition up to change the constitution can do so. Three times has an opportunity three times a year to do it. So you can see how easy it is, basically, if you're a specialist, just to get your get your uh, things up and running. The other part of the Constitution is that we now have a, and have had since 1966, a full-time legislature. So they meet 11 months a year, and they've created this monstrous bureaucracy that's basically yeah. driving the entire state. So the politicians, the governor, really have no influence on this bureau- bureaucratic status, and that's what we see so much of the overreach from. And, of course, uh, with the COVID virus thing, the uh, governor declared himself the dictator, basically, mm-hmm. through executive orders. And that's where we stand right now. In fact, we're, we have a lawsuit against the governor for voter fraud for the, le- the recent uh, uh, November 3rd uh, vote. And it can, we're, we're suing the governor for is the fact that he, uh, through an unconstitutional executive order, ordered all the mail-in ballots uh, to be sent to all the voters in California. There's only one problem with that. They had the wrong instructions on the ballot, and statutory law by California says that you cannot cast or count a ballot if that language is not included. So all those ballots, millions of ballots that were cast in California, are basically illegal. And we've got it in court right now. It's a statutory law. We don't even need a trial. We just need a hearing, and we're working on that. We put in our motion just recently. We want to have all 55 electoral votes decertified from California, made null and void, based upon the fact that election fraud that has been tied to Dominion, and that's the only part of it, but also that these ballots were no good to begin with. It's a very, very straight law, so we stand a very good chance, and we're very, very excited about it. But this is only one way in which we address issues. We're building a government. We've already had uh, seven constitutional conventions. We have a bicameral legislature. We're passing resolutions. Uh, we've actually written now our Declaration of Independence, wow. and uh, we're moving forward. Like, you know, we're having hearings. In fact, tomorrow we're having our fifth um, uh, Citizens Committee hearing, and this is going to be on how to open the businesses because schools are closed, churches are closed, businesses are closed. Because if you're a communist, the one thing you want to do is you want to get a rid of the free market economy. And through that huge bureaucracy that we have, they've been managing to keep everybody intimidated and fearful from using phony data and information. And that's all starting to surface out here in California. The facts behind the COVID fear um, are just not there. The data is not there. They've been lying to us with what we've been saying all along. And that's going to start surfacing more and more. And in fact, so much so 
So you have a recall against the governor, and the governor now has backed away from a lot of the, uh, just in the last couple of days, has backed away from a lot of the closures and masking and things like that. It's funny what a little recall will do to a governor. <laughs> but uh, he's, you know, he's got other problems, too. You may have heard that just recently California is fiscally bankrupt, but one of the reasons we cannot open schools is there's no money to open schools. So you have a whole generation of kids that are lost because they could not attend school this year and they're not going to be able to open the schools because they don't have the money. That's why this stimulus bill that was just approved by the 5150 um, uh, in, the, in the Congress just about an hour ago is so important to California. They think they're going to be able to get some money out of that to keep themselves afloat. But the problem is, last week, the Democratic state auditor, Elaine Howell, came out with the fact that California's Employment Development Department, that's their unemployment, has defrauded the public of anywhere between 15 and $50 billion. By the way, all that money apparently has gone out of state, out of California to other states. Wow. Um, I mean, it, it just doesn't get, you know, I mean, it just gets worse and worse and worse the more you dig in this thing in California. The only thing that's going to change California is a new state with a new constitution in which we have a Republican form of government, which is guaranteed to us by Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution, and Section 4 of the Constitution. And that has not been granted the Republican form of government, nor the other two elements of that, which is freedom from invasion and freedom from domestic violence. You know, you got the sanctuary state thing here that's murdering people, and people literally are getting away with murder in California. It's very violent. It's certainly become very violent. And, of course, we're going to bring back rule of law. We're going to bring back free market economy. We're going to be a shining star on the hill. There's no question about it. And the whole nation is going to benefit by the explosion to the economic boom that's going to take off in New California. New California occupies about 90% of the land mass. Um, we divided up the state by population. Is there, where, where's, 20, where's 40 million people live? We looked at the urbanized areas, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Sacramento, and shockingly, 20 million people live there. And the rest of the state has 20 million, too. So um, New California, we're the rest of the state. So we're basically the same state, just uh, only some small areas that are urbanized in California that will remain. Do you, and, do you, uh, an, do you anticipate resistance? Like resistance very little. From... Now, the the yeah. problem is, is that they don't have the money. Um, they, they just don't have the money to function, and we're the only opportunity. We've already talked to people on Wall Street and, and other places that are going to be able to help us out um, that, to get us up and running and going. Uh, California is going to have to change its constitution, and we're going to make that very, very clear. We're going to be more than happy to help them out of their fiscal condition because we can. We'll have the resources to do it, and we're going to buy our freedom. Uh, but, you know, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be demanding that they change their constitution to get away from this communist-centered constitution that they have uh, that's brought about this uh, form of communism, very, very, uh, you know, um, weird form of communism, the communism that we have in California that's not going to stand. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to have to re be replaced by a Republican form of government like in other states like Texas and just about, well, not all the states in the Union, you have New York, which is very similar to ours in behavior and I, I other was, places. That makes me, that, I'm glad you brought that up because when you talk about this, I'm thinking if you're successful, what's to prevent other states from forming or other parts of states from forming new states and having that, like a balkanization occurring of the states, of the 50 states of the United States becoming hundreds of states? Well, that's just it. Um, we're gonna, what's happened now is there is a balkanization of states. Those that are uh, following this variety of government, this very pernicious variety of communism, I say, and uh, you, you see this where you have the control that's uh, brought about by the urbanized areas. One of the things that controls it, of course, is the lack of representation. And that started in 1964 when state senators were no longer assigned to sovereigns. And as a result, they had to be associated with population. So the rural areas of a state, if you look at them, they don't have any representation. They mm. used to have representation by counties, but that, that's all district now based upon population. So that will shift dramatically with us because we're going to restore that concept of the county senator. But uh, there's other states that know this, that are trying this. Like, there's new Illinois. There's a new, new movement going on. There. They just declared their wow. independence, I think, October 17th. 
And um, you know, how come we don't hear about this? Data. We're not here. I hadn't hear, I hadn't heard about any of this. Well, it's uh, you know, it's a movement that's been moving quietly, you know, under the radar. And uh, now we're at the point where we've actually submitted uh, various letters to ask for statehood as early as March. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Next month. What part of the yeah, what part month. of the st- what part of the state? What part of California? Well, it'd be all of it. You know, we're talking about ninety percent of the state of California uh, would become New California. So wow. From yeah, you, if you take a look at our state map, the red is the all California, New California, and yellow is old. And uh, it's it's going to have to be that way because that's where the populations are. That's amazing. Well, gosh, you're you're our one motivated guy, Paul Preston. Thank you so much for being yes, on the bright side. That was hey, very thank enlightening. You very much. Thank you, buddy. NewCaliforniaState.com. NewCaliforniaState.com. Thank you. Paul Preston, founder and president of the Movement for a New California State and host of Agenda 21 Radio. Thank you for being on the Bright Side, Paul. Best of luck to you. And that's all the time we have for today on the Bright Side. Thanks for listening, friends. I am Pharmacist Ben. Have a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, spectacular day. We'll talk to you later, folks. Bye for now.